we're here to talk today about, on the information sharing track about uh, really the convergence between advanced technology for bridging systems and data sources and bringing everything together in a harmonious way, uh, but with taking into account and respecting the governance parameters under which these systems have to operate both in an intrastate capacity, which is what we're talking about here, also in an interstate capacity, uh, which also obviously introduces a whole host of other governance challenges that obviously the time today won't allow us to get into. Um, the one thing I want to make sure everyone knows is that we are talking about a countywide implementation here, and as Julia will, when, when she speaks a little later on, the, the goal is to expand it to multiple counties uh, and maybe even crossing into, uh, New, into New Jersey at some point. Um, this, the, the governance and technology convergence that happened in this project and really gives it the, the, the reason why it was selected for this, for this case study is replicable at state levels, obviously, Kathy mentioned uh, the Missouri Data Exchange that we're part of. Uh, so the same, the same challenges, the same successes, and the same, the same solution pathways that enabled this project to be very successful uh, are very replicable up to, to larger initiatives uh, that anyone may be looking to do. Uh, before I go any further, let me introduce our esteemed panel here. Uh, uh, we all know each other, so I don't have to read uh, from, a, from a canned bio for these people. I know them very well. Um, to my right is Chief Douglas Kish with the Catasauqua Police Department. Uh, Chief Kish was, uh, at the time that the Lehigh County Real-Time Law Enforcement Network project kicked off, was instrumental in getting it off the ground in his role as president of the Chiefs Association at the time. Uh, now, since that time, he has been a evangelist for the project, uh, keeping people together, keeping his fellow chiefs all engaged and informed, uh, and serving pretty much as an informal, maybe even a little formal uh, liaison for the chiefs to the county uh, to keep things moving forward and keep the lines of communication and governance open. So. Uh, Chief Kish will be speaking in just a minute on, on how to secure agency buy-in and balance these technology and governance issues with them. We have to Chief Kish's right, uh, Bard Falcaro, who is Cody's Executive Director of Technical Operations. Uh, in the role that she played with this project, Barb was the overall project manager and still serves as the project manager for this important project for us and the county. Um, she is extremely knowledgeable about the governance issues about the technology, obviously, but most importantly, she is the glue that keeps this thing together, and uh, she's, she's just a valuable source of information. She actually serves on the IPSTIC committee, um, so we're very happy to have her here. Um, and last but not least, we have Julia Kosis, who is, serves two different roles in the project. She was the county's counterpart project manager opposite Barb, uh, working with the Attorney General's office on certain issues of governance that, that we'll get into a little later and also just getting all the moving parts of everything for the county and serving as a liaison for the chiefs. Uh, secondarily, uh, she is also serves as the regional information and intelligence. Did I say that backwards? Is it information? Intelligence and investigation. And, oh, gosh. Okay. It's the RIC. We know it as the RIC. And sometimes um, the, the real-time crime center, essentially, for the county uh, and that is fueled by the data coming from this technology and the system that we've all put in place and, and put together here. Uh, and she'll have a few slides to talk about that and how this whole thing fits together governance-wise with that. So um, before I turn it over to Chief Kiss, just a little two-minute overview of what this is about and the learning objectives. I need the, uh, the clicker. Um, so what is the purpose here? We have three learning objectives. One is when you're looking at building a real-time information sharing network for justice, for law enforcement, for any sort of domain in this world that we all live in, this, this CGIS world, um, too many times you can get distracted by, as, uh, as Doug Robinson, I think, this morning, the NACIO uh, board said, get distracted by the shiny thing. And it happens all the time. We've seen it many times where there are, there are really neat tools that can be used to mine data and extend the use of your data at a countywide level or a region or a state. And those are all wonderful. But, the, but time and time again, it has shown to us through working with our county and state partners that you have to build the foundation first. And we're going to get into what that means. But honestly, 
the foundation, and that this blends with the second learning objective. The foundation has to include technology that is granularly flexible enough to accommodate the needs of the law enforcement officers in the field, the analysts at the Fusion Center or Real-Time Crime Center, the district attorney's office, the, the jail and the sheriffs, as well as the needs of all other consumers of the data, but at the same time that it's balancing the governance. The foundation has to include good governance, because otherwise you're not going to be able to do anything, and, and the project will just stall. You'll have, you'll have disparate camps of, of people saying, no, it should work this way, no, it should work this way. The governance is critical for these, and that's really the point of the presentation. And last but not least, paperless real-time exchange is very doable. Okay, this is not a pipe dream. It's not magic. It's not some, some potion that you can drink. It's something that requires work, and it requires good partnership between private industry and practitioners. But it is very doable. It's been done, and uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Kish to just give a little background on the project, some of the challenges that led Lehigh County to want to do this, and uh, how to secure some agency buy-in when you're looking to do this kind of a county level or larger project. Chief? Thank you, Dave. Let me get my stuff out of your way. Just to give you some, some quick facts as to the area that we're located. Uh, we're in Pennsylvania, obviously, uh, about an hour north of Philadelphia and about an hour south of New York City. Um, you can see by the map there, we've got quite a few interstate roadways uh, linked there. Interstate 78 really ties us into uh, New York City. We're in the New York metropolitan area. We have a population of around 355,000 plus. Uh, two cities, uh, Allentown and Bethlehem. Allentown, which is the largest, third largest city in the state. Uh, the city of Bethlehem, which transcends two counties, uh, Lehigh County and Northampton County. Six boroughs, 14 townships. There are 17 individual police departments, including the city of Allentown and Bethlehem, and the Pennsylvania State Police Troop M. So we had a lot of law enforcement agencies that we needed to tie together here. Uh, as president, of the, as Dave said, I was president of the Chiefs Association when we created this monster. And... Um, our goal was, and, and what we saw was there were five different records management systems, none of which were sharing information. Uh, a, a township next to a, a local borough could query a name and they would never hit the jurisdiction right next to them. They weren't getting real-time data. They were getting data as it was, some departments had it set up that, it, you know, the report had to be approved before it could be distributed to the uh, other agencies. Uh, so we, we, our goal was a one-stop shop so everybody could share real-time data. Uh, officers were stopping people and querying names and they weren't getting the information and it, it, was a crea it was an officer safety issue. So we needed to address those issues and get our, our goals straight. We took five or six different records management systems, uh, we evaluated them, we, we set our standards, what we were looking for, and we selected our vendor to, uh, to start the project. <clears throat> we built a countywide system. Uh, the city of Allentown, unfortunately, had just received a huge grant before we went into this project, which was actually 2007. Um, they had gotten a huge grant and had purchased another records management system, but we still wanted to include them in the data, sh data sharing. Uh, it was very important since they had a huge piece of the data that we needed to include them in, in the project. So we were crossing jurisdictions. We were crossing, actually with, this, with the city of Bethlehem, we were crossing counties uh, getting information. We had a one-stop search of all connected RMS databases. That was our goal, one time. The officer checks a name, and it hits all the different databases. We also wanted to make sure that each database was separate, not that we were commingling uh, one township and one borough together, that each database was separate, and each, each department governed their database. Access to the countywide information, and at that time, we were also looking into central booking. Uh, central booking was a very important tie-in to this whole project because they would get 
the part of the individual, the suspect that we took in there, and what they did needed to come back to the, each individual department's records management system. So we were tying in the district attorney's office and the central booking to, uh, to get that information back. Uh, we kept Allentown in the system. Uh, we were able to integrate central booking and also the district attorney's office. When an officer completes a report, we mark it, each individual department marks it ready for the district attorney, and now the district attorney has access to the entire report without having to call each local municipality or fax it to them, and we'd have to fax them a copy of the report. So they're sharing that information along with, uh, with the individual department. We only wanted to give the individual officers enough information and not overload them with it. Uh, we, we just wanted to give them the basics, flags, whether the suspect was, uh, you know, had a weapon, uh, had known to be, have a weapon, or, or just to protect the officer to make sure they had the, the proper information. And we needed to make it real time. The governance challenges, we need to establish a buy-in. We had to get all the county chiefs on the same page. How many law enforcement do we have in here at the moment? None. Well, trust me, trying to get 17 county police chiefs on the same page is a challenge. Everybody wants to hold their cards right here, and they don't want anybody else to see it. We had to emphasize the importance of being able to share this information with other departments. It's, it sounds like a huge challenge, but once we explained why and how we were going to do it, uh, we, we got MOUs signed by every county chief. Um, we also had to draw in the district attorney's office for CREA. We um, had an intelligence officer trained in each department, in each of the 17 departments, and we had MOUs with the district attorney's office uh, to so we could exchange information there. And Doug, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to speak a little bit about the specifics of the Attorney General's regulations regarding information sharing. Because I think once you, once once we transition here, I'll, I'll take a, a, a shot at that because I think it's important to know that the Pennsylvania is one of the most restrictive states. If anyone is from Pennsylvania, you may know this. The Criminal History Records Information Act in Pennsylvania is very very strict about what police officers can can't see secondary dissemination. So. Um, this is a perfect transition, Dave. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. I, I was just about ready to give it to Barb, but Excellent. take that right from there. Okay. Um, just to build on what Chief Kish said, that, that the establishing buy-in was huge for this. Um, and I think one of the things, if I'm remembering being part of that, one of the things that was really important was that each individual agency felt as though their individual data sharing rule, or their not data sharing, their data governance rules in their agency were respected. So it wasn't like the county was just saying, you're going to do this or else. It was, we're going to come together and figure out what each agency wants to do with its data and who can see what and where and when. So it started from a very, very baseline grassroots level, not forcing things from the top. Now, obviously, what I'm about to talk about with the attorney general regulations, yes, that had to come from the top, and there's no way around that. Um, but... Just to give you a little background on the AG's regulations, for anyone, everyone counting at home, the citation is Pennsylvania Title 18, Chapter 91. It's called the Criminal History Records Information Act. And essentially what it boils down to is, there's one of these in every state, what it boils down to is that it establishes three levels of information access to law enforcement. One is protected, one is investigative, and one is intelligence. Protected and investigative really are just what they sound like. It's not the, the, the real thrust of the policy is that line between what is considered investigative and intelligence information. Investigative and protected are directly related to criminal activity that is documented and arguably all public record. Intelligence information are things like SAR, things like that are not directly related to a actual criminal event. So gang affiliation is a perfect example of this, where in a narrative, you might, an officer might say, um, you know, I observed, I observed Jose Rodriguez at the corner of 8th and Walnut uh, talking with people who I know are part of the 8th Street thugs. That's not really criminal justice related information. It's, it is, but it's, it's more to the point where it's a supposition, it's an observation, but it's not something 
that is considered protected investigative information. It's definitely considered intelligence information. And uh, Barb Falcaro is now going to talk a little bit about how that affected the way that we rolled out the project in concert with the chiefs. Uh, this was not a this was not a, a straightforward rollout. It had a lot of edges to it, and Barb's the person to talk about that. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dave and Doug. Um, yeah, as uh, Dave was talking about, there were certainly some challenges. Um, you know, with the governance uh, as it related to following CREA, getting the chiefs on board. <laughs> Julie and Doug and I had wars, I guess uh, <laughs> you could say, with, with them, you know, just trying to make them understand why the need uh, to, to do this, uh, you know, kind of what the purpose was, you know, in, in, in sharing their data. I think everybody realized, uh, you know, obviously that it was uh, officer safety and, and things like that, but when it came down to the nitty gritty and actually evaluating, giving up, uh, some ownership of of, uh, of their data. Uh, there were some security issues. Um, Dave already spoke about CREA. Um, one of the things that I, I was fortunate to have is strong partners uh, for the project in, in Doug and Julia, where we worked together and we were able to uh, get involvement from the uh, DA's office. And uh, Julie and I would met, met with the DA's office and demonstrated Cody and what can be seen and went through the whole system and, and showed the uh, security options. You know, one of the big things that uh, Heather, who we worked with there, wanted to focus on was making sure that, you know, they could be restrictive and, and make sure that uh, CREA was going to be followed. And they even met with the Attorney General's office and, and got their data sharing policy that they wrote, uh, blessed by the Attorney General's office and uh, said, yeah, okay, what you guys want to do there is definitely okay and it doesn't violate CREA and, you know, kind of got their backing. So we were fortunate to, you know, to have good involvement from the DA's office as well. We worked uh, with the DA's office and Julia and Doug and we set up joint trainings, uh, which was actually pretty good because each uh, agency had to have an intelligence officer who was responsible for uh, making sure that intelligence data wasn't disseminated, you know, so they had to review and make sure, especially was it related to gang affiliations, um, that that data was held close to the vest until the gang affiliations were uh, proven. So we worked together with them to, to offer the training to show them how both in their CODI system and also in CTAC, whether they had a CODI records or not, they could secure their data and you know, make sure that their intelligence officer reviewed everything that was being shared to make sure that they weren't violating the, the policy. <coughs> we gave them a little bit of a starting point with a memorandum of understanding that some legal person at Cody wrote at some point to uh, <laughs> kind of give a, a starting point, and then their DA's office took that and, and kind of formulated their own policy uh, and linked it back to the data sharing policy, and uh, Julia hunted people down to make sure that got signed. <laughs> so. Um, one of the, to, just to get to the technology here, um, one of the big things that was very important was the, the data aggregation. Uh, you heard Doug mention that they wanted to make sure that their data wasn't commingled. Um, Cody's been doing data sharing for a long time, and uh, one of our foundational uh, designs was to not have a data warehouse where everything's thrown together and mixed, and mixed in. Uh, you know, we've seen... In my years at Cody, we've seen projects like that fail, and then people don't want to participate, and they want to pull their data out, and it's a nightmare to, uh, to, to back out, as well as just things get mixed up and, and the security becomes a concern. We provided a common operating data platform for uh, Lehigh County so that regardless of whether they're using a Cody system or another vendor system as they are in Allentown, they could contribute and share data and be confident that the data would be secure and, uh, and segregated. Um, so even though the different data structures exist, uh, which in other implementations we have more uh, diverse data, data segregation, you know, uh, databases, it, it's all segregated and there's, and there's no need to worry about uh, commingling. One of the main things that we had to concern ourselves with is the different size agencies. We're dealing with agencies the size of Allentown and Bethlehem, where they're very large, very high crime, you know, obviously have different concerns, and then agencies like Copley, you know, this very small department, don't have the same kind of concerns, and, and we needed to make sure that the solution that we were providing was 
sufficient for both the small and large scale uh, agencies. We also needed to make sure that the solution was future proofed. Uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that the integration strategy allowed for submission to NDEX, submission to NIBRS, you know, other data sources being uh, sucked into to the uh, data warehouse. My technical term there. <laughs> sucked in. Yeah, sucked like in. <laughs> um, and we needed to make sure, going back to the different agencies, that the data sharing rules could be set by each individual agency. We didn't want to, you know, although the consortium had the overriding um, deciding factor on the, the most, the restrictive data sharing rules, we didn't want to, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that each agency, should they feel that they needed to be more restrictive in some way, shape, or form, that they could be. They had the uh, capability, and I'll show you here in a second, in the administrative tool to go in and say that certain types and, and certain profiles of, of people couldn't see certain types of data. So it's a very flexible solution, um, giving them really all the control to, to the data and the access, the, you know, permissions and so forth. Um, one of the main areas where they initially got benefit of, of the system was the tactical search app. So as soon as we got data syncing, as soon as we got agencies alive, we started training on the tactical search app. How do we find this data? How do we use it for officer safety purposes? What information can this give us at, at the fingertips of the officer on the street who's knocking on someone's door to serve a warrant or follow up on a noises and fights, what can we tell them about the, the person that they're going to interact with? And that was the most important piece that we had to get out to the field as soon as possible. So we worked very closely with them and uh, obviously got the, the tactical app out, in, out in, into their fingertips with zero deployment, um, made sure that all the data synchronization was real time. Uh, so you, you pull someone over in one jurisdiction, you, you, get, you get them down the street, it's all real time. The, the access, you know, is, it's available. It's not real time in fake terms. I mean, it was within six seconds. You could go from one town to another and, and make sure that the data is, it's available to their fingertips. The full implementation allowed them as Doug indicated prior, to stop faxing reports to, to, the, to the DA's office, to stop printing out the hard copy paper report that they used to take to the Central Booking Center. Working with the Lehigh County um, project team, we were able to deploy um, mobile units for their ability to, to interact with the Central Booking. So they literally have a laptop there, they enter their booking information while another person's just running DUIs, uh, you know, people to the to the central booking center. No more did they need to take get. I'm, I'm the arrest. I'm the arrester. I'm taking them down. You know, fill out my forms. The data comes back through the system from CPIN, which is the Commonwealth uh, uh, Photo Imaging Network system. So they get the photos all the way back into their systems and available in CTAC within minutes of entering it into the system. So the use of the data, and then the vision from the beginning was, of course, fueling the regional crime center, getting this data available to the detectives who can see contacts with people and, and help them in their investigations. More than once, uh, we heard from our agencies, oh yeah, well, PSP couldn't find this guy, and we looked him up in SeaTac, and they you know, went to his house and did an arrest within minutes you know, where other agencies and surrounding didn't have access, and then said, how do we get this tool? How do we get on board with this? We want to we wanna have access as well. So stemming more into the technical, you know, we have a diagram here that speaks a little bit to the model that we've deployed for years. Um, you notice that there are a couple things here. I want to point out to you that the different data sources that are going into the COBRA core Various data sources, jail, uh, um, healthcare systems if you want to, the RMS systems, different databases, different formats. Doesn't have to be database format. You want to give, you want us to suck in XML, you want us to uh, import in uh, CSV files or any kind of standard structured format. Uh, your, your RMS vendors really old and doesn't really exist anymore, but you want to keep running on, on you know, that platform, 
we have the tools, you know, the arrows in our quiver to pull out and say, okay, how can we get this data out of your system so you can participate in this data sharing initiative? And then, so the data can flow out to these other areas so that analytics can be run on it, reporting, mapping, you know, a de deploying a crime mapping solution for the citizens in Lehigh County can be done within minutes. The data is already there in the, in the core. It's in a common structure, and you can bolt on all these different tools very easily. Sending data to index, not something that we're doing yet in this project, if Pennsylvania ever gets out of their own way, something that we've talked about. Um, we are in Missouri. We are, absolutely, yeah, we are in other areas. But, you know, these are things that are important to the longevity, to future-proofing the solution uh, for data sharing. And it's very important to make sure that your solution is able to, to accommodate the future, the future plans. Um, getting, the, getting the project done. You know, so many times in the industry, we hear about uh, projects like this that have failed. You can't get the governance people, you know, to agree. You can't get the solutions implemented before you ran out of budget funding. You know, all these kinds of things. You know, I, I'm proud that we got this solution up, running, successful, and built on top of it since then, you know, since the original inception, since the seed of the idea. <clears throat> We've provided a holistic, future-proof foundation for data integration and the interchange of tools that are used to access and query the data with, with no disruption to the foundation. And no disruption to the actual local systems as well. Absolutely. The These agencies have no idea when we're working with the RIC to you know, for them to query data that is housed in the silo. When agencies are running queries in the dead of night looking for some information about a, a hit and run they saw or whatever, agencies' systems aren't affected by it. All of that communication goes through the core. So to talk a little bit uh, about the tactical uh, search app, so this is what the Lehigh County police officers see in their vehicles. They, this is showing a results screen, but this gives them quick, quick access, quick information. You can see here the PSP agencies. Pennsylvania, uh, that's Pennsylvania Pen State Police. Yep, sorry. <laughs> Pennsylvania State Police agencies are uh, available as well as all the other jurisdictions that Doug spoke of uh, earlier in our presentation. Mm -hmm. You can see a, a quick glance of information on your screen. Uh, for each person and, and kind of get a, a quick view of the person. Is this the person I'm looking for? You get images, you know, some highlights about you know, where they live, identifiers and those sorts of things. And, and whose, whose data is this? So if this is someone that's local to me, you know, possibly it's the same person. You know, just quick, quick information at your fingertips comes back faster than uh, clean NCIC, Lord knows. But, you know... <laughs> Those results will filter in when they come back as well. It's important to note, actually, not to gloss over that, this, this system is truly a one-stop search. So if you have a link into NCIC, or you have a link now, again, for Lehigh, they, they, they haven't gone to, to index primarily because of some limitations with, the, with Pennsylvania and the link to the FBI. But um, when that is enabled, when you do a search of a person in Lehigh County, you will be able to get all that information back asynchronously. So you get your results back, and then when hits come back from NCIC, they come back. When an index return comes back, that will come back. So it truly becomes a one-stop search for an officer at the point of contact in the field uh, to protect them and the citizens. So, Thank you asynchronously for joining me in the technical discussion. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Figured I'd toss that in. <laughs> Give these lawyers a couple keywords and they <laughs> use them uh, over and over. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. That's all right. I'm so used to it. this is uh, just a glance at the uh, security. Just to give you an example, of how I was talking about the restrictions that are able to be set. So in this example, we're showing that there are restrictions on the sworn personnel, civilian personnel groups that are set up, and the restrictions include gang, gang rank, gang set. So 
well, in this case, they actually show allow, but you could set restrictions on them as well. So, I mean, down to the field level, we have other implementations where they say, well, we don't want to share social security no numbers, you know, from our system because this agency who's contributing, and even though they can search it, they're not law enforcement, so we don't want them to see social security numbers. Okay, fine. So you go in here and, and we can show them how down to the field level they can be restrictive. The nice thing is that the consortium has the ultimate control over how lenient they can be on the data sharing rules. So they, they make sure by setting the initial rules for the consortium, no agency can be less restrictive and give access to something and violate the policy. They have the ultimate control over it. So then if they want to be more, if the agencies want to be more restrictive, certainly they can go ahead and do that. But there's no concern of, oh gosh, I have to monitor this to make sure that the policy isn't violated. They don't have to worry about it. So the next slide I'm going to get into is uh, Julia. I want to just pass it back to Dave real quick because he wanted to speak about something that I don't recall. <laughs> okay, so now we're, we talked about the technology. We talked about the, the tactical applications of this, which was the police officer's primary goal. But as we said from the beginning, this was not just about that. It was about establishing a foundation for the data integration projects and the uses of the data from a multitude of different use cases across the county. Uh, Barb mentioned, uh, just to reiterate, the paperless exchange was huge. I mean, that, that's, uh, Doug mentioned that, uh, I'm sure Julie is going to mention it too, that was just such a big buy-in win for everyone. The DA's office was, was getting overwhelmed with paper, as I'm sure we all, we all know. That integrated justice component of this project was what really, I think, propelled it beyond just being a police department initiative and why the county was really behind it from the very beginning. Um, that coupled with the electronic centralized booking was big too. I mean, Barb mentioned it, just to, just to put a finer point on it. It's all about reducing the time that it takes to do something and the effort and the, and the, uh, the amount of paper that goes around. Use of standards, you know, use of, of, of information exchange things. You meant on that, on the, the slide that Barb had up there with the diagram. Use of NEEM exchanges. These things that are simplifying this, this technology, are things that, that are woven into this platform and have been put to ex excellent use. And uh, one of the, one, I think one of the neatest extensions of, of what, we, what we worked on together with the county was what Julie is going to talk about next, and that is the RIC. I'll let her explain what that is, but essentially it's a real-time crime center that is fueled by the data from this system that we are aggregating from all the different police departments regardless of the records management system or database that they have. Uh, so, Julia? Well, laying the foundation, what they had just talked about, that actually paved the way for the Lehigh County Regional Intelligence and Investigation Center. It's also known as the RIC. And what the RIC is, it's a combination of technology and services that are performed by sworn law enforcement and civilian intelligence analysts to assist with investigative case support. We currently serve the 17 local police departments in Lehigh County. Pennsylvania State Police Troop M and their Criminal Intelligence Center stationed in Harrisburg, as well as our local FBI field office. So the RIC was a goal of ours since 2006, a full two years prior to the implementation of the countywide police RMS project. The RIC was our end goal. And we thought, you know, if we had the patience and built a solid foundation first, we could probably better realize our end goal and possibly save time and money in the process. So with all of our police departments already submitting their data up to a central repository, which is the cobra.net core, and by being able to partner with our RMS vendor to bridge any gaps with other police data source needs that we had, we realized that we did not need to waste our development time on reinventing the ETL wheel because it already existed for us through COBRA. And this cleared the way for us to focus our development efforts on designing the intelligence information system for the center and the applications that were tailored towards our investigators and our specialized task forces. 
So the RIG technology solution integrates various software tools and components into a single interface. The system can query a wide variety of data sources and extract vital information out necessary to help solve crime. Thanks to the COBRA system, we have access to 4 million police incident and arrest records, inclusive of narratives, photos, gang information, vehicle data, and property data, as well as Lehigh County prison records, which include incarceration data, visitor logs, phone logs, and inmate financial transactions. Prior to this, investigators sometimes had to wait days or even weeks, go through complicated workflows, usually involving multiple parties, just to get access to the data that they needed for their investigation. Now it's available to them in a single interface in an easy to use and an understandable format. In addition to the local data sources that we integrated into the system, we also developed and utilized web services so we could query and exchange data with other regional, state, and federal partners. And we were able to work with Accurant LexisNexis on a web service so we could query public records right from within our interface. And I think it's probably important to note that I'm usually asked, what was the most difficult part of the RIC project? And everyone assumes that it's some long, drawn out, complicated systems integration process when in fact, the technology is the easy part. What I usually end up telling them is that it's working through the policy and agreeing upon the policy when there's multiple agencies involved in a data sharing project of this size. So policy and data governance really take center stage in projects of this nature. And being able to work with vendors that understand this and address this by Building security into their technology stack that we can use within our project makes for a tr truly successful data sharing project. So that's where we're located. Lehigh is the county highlighted in red, and then our neighboring counties flanked on either side of us are green and blue. We're really close to New York and New Jersey, in fact, that's where all of our gang influence comes from. We're about an hour and I'd say a half travel time from that metro area. So the RIC has really become a game changer for local law enforcement. We were able to build a center in the system within 15 months time, thanks to being able to partner with our vendor. And it's achieved numerous success in that short amount of time. We opened our doors January of last year and we've assisted investigators in numerous homicides, burglaries, robberies, cold cases, drug and gang investigations. <coughs> and we've been, we presented this project to all the district attorneys in the state of Pennsylvania. Many of them are already in some level of RIC assessment to understand what it's going to take to set up RICs within their region. So we feel what we've been able to develop is a replicable model that really addresses the needs of regional and local investigators. And it's so portable that it could be set up anywhere. It really only needs to be tailored to the data sharing policies that govern those regions. And I'll hand it back to Dave. All right. I think, I think Julia would also say that uh, this is a living, breathing project. This isn't something that has ended here just because we're at this point. Um, they keep adding data sources, and, and we just keep refining this whole project. Uh, it's not going away. Uh, there's been a lot of money and a lot of time invested in it, and, and it really is growing leaps and bounds as we sit here. I think it's become a model for a lot of others to look at. I know when Julie goes around and talks to folks about the RIC, you know, as she said, they ask about the questions and how to get this done. You know, I think there was a really good, strong partnership, and we had the technology together uh, and uh, could could deploy. And uh, as Julia said, you know, just kind of working out the the political issues is kind of where a lot of the agents, the implementations are are going to struggle. I think where uh, we were able to work as a team to knock mm -hmm. them out of the way. Yeah. Uh, my personal kind of favorite coup that, that I think the project team overcame here was multiple, everyone here really talked about it, but uh, the inclusion of the Pennsylvania State Police in a project like this was 
somewhat unprecedented. Uh, if anyone knows, the Pennsylvania State Police does not have an electronic records management system. They have tracks, which is a citation-based system, but they are, they don't nest at this point yet have an electronic record system. So they struggle with what happens when the Pennsylvania State Police need to book someone. What do they do? And Julia, would you mind talking a little bit about that process sure. and how that was integrated? The Pennsylvania State Police use our central booking facility to book the individuals in Lehigh County. And because they don't have a records management system and they cover the majority of the landmass for patrol in Lehigh County, we can't check to see if names come up that Pennsylvania State Police Troop M have come in contact with. So what we were able to do was through the central booking module that we utilize at the facility, PSP officers come in, they drop the arrestee off, central booking officers process the individual, and they enter all that information right into CPIN, which is then ported back into central booking repository, which is available through COBRA or CTAC. And where that circle is, the central booking officers will denote all that information. That way, if you want to run a name on someone and they've been stopped by PSP, all the information is there for the officer. That really, just to reiterate something, that really closed the data blindness in the county that had existed prior. Um, without a records management system, you don't have a database to pull information from. So even though we had this great technology, Cobra.net, it, it, there's nothing we could do. There's no data to pull. So having this, this revelation with the project team to say, well, why don't we just have the, the state police in our jurisdiction basically add data into the county records infrastructure through the central booking site was really, really, I think, one of the neatest things that the project team did. That decision really closed that data blindness. For anyone who lives in a state or a commonwealth where they don't, where large areas of a county are patrolled by, they, there's not an incorporated entity there. Uh, you know, and in Pennsylvania, sheriff's offices are not the same as they are in the Midwest. In Pennsylvania, sheriff's offices have a much more limited jurisdiction. So the Pennsylvania State Police is contracted to patrol these areas, and without this kind of a system in place, the local jurisdictions, when they're running these people, they may never have been picked up by anyone except for the, for the state police. And now, through this, through the, the really great decision making, I think, on the part of the project team here, PSP is able to be part of it on their own terms, but the police officers throughout the county have the benefit of having data where they had none before and really had no way to get it. Uh, just, can I just, yeah, just yeah. touch, touch on one thing? Understand, this is, the Cobra.net is in the patrol cars. Yeah. It's not, this isn't something they have to go back to headquarters to look at. They log in right in the car and can pull this data up. It's not something that, that's on a computer in somebody's office or, or in a headquarters. It's in every patrol car in the county. So basically, let me go back to the end slide here. Uh, I kind of backed it up so we can talk about that for a second. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this same technology that is, is being used here, um, a great example of how this can be used at a larger implementation is the Missouri Data Exchange. In that case, there are hundreds of agencies, 45 million records, 1 million photos, 35 to 40 different providers' systems being represented in there. And the reason I bring it up here is just to bring it back to the beginning where we said, look, these things, sometimes there's this disconnect between what people think, oh, well, a county did that, a state can't do that. It's a completely different beast. It's not the case. You can, you can achieve the same governance and technology blend at any level if you just have a responsible, well, I mean, why are we here? A technology partner that can help you do it, but also you have to have buy-in, and as you can see from the partnership that's clear from, from, from the people we have here and the relationship we have, it's all about the relationship between the two. It's about blending the governance and the technology together to achieve a common purpose. When you do that, this is the kind of result that can happen. And um, at this point, uh, if anyone has any questions of anyone here, uh, we're going to open it up to questions, and uh, hopefully we'll get you out of here a little early. If anybody's copying my email address up there, there's a D in front of it. 
It's uh, it's D Kish. Oh, I have to talk about this PowerPoint. <laughs>